My name is Barry Adams and it is Wednesday, August the 21st, 2013 and I am uh, talking about the subject of overcoming unbelief. And uh, this is something that I, I really believe it's it's just a reminder that uh, for you and I and, it, and you know I have the opportunity when I am speaking on a webcast like I'm actually seeing myself on the screen so in many ways when I do this I I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to you so I, I really want you to you know know the spirit in which I I'm sharing today I'm, I'm not sharing as from a place of, of having accomplished and overcome this whole area of unbelief this is an area that you know I wrestle with probably just like you do but I just felt today that that uh, the Lord really wanted to encourage you you and encourage me that there would just be a just a kind of a reminder what he loves and and how you know understanding that we're all in uh, this boat together you know it's not one of us is is uh, separate we're all wrestling with believing in um, you know the kingdom to come you know that to as as Jesus taught us to pray the Lord's prayer your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and so we're living with the tension of that because we are living and and declaring and proclaiming a kingdom that is that is not in this realm in the natural and so we are the conduits we are the vessels in which God's kingdom which is in another dimension so to speak is manifest in this world and because of that there's there are there can be some tension right because it's things that we don't necessarily see or things that are, are not necessarily tangible and so there can be some some struggle along with that so uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about the the rich young ruler and if you guys know the story you know it's a it's a story that you know a lot of us know and and where where a young man came to Jesus and he you know he was full of all kinds of self-assurance and confidence that you know he's he's pretty much done, done everything he could to inherit eternal life and but he wanted to come to Jesus and he wanted to be assured of of what else he could do so let's just read the story and it comes in in Mark chapter 10 verse 17 to 23 and most of the scriptures I'm reading are from the World English Bible. So it's, it reads, it starts this way. As he was going out into the way, one ran to him, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have observed all these things from my youth. Now, it's interesting, this next line, he says, Jesus looked at him and loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me, taking up the cross. But his face fell at that saying, and he went away sorrowful, for he was one who had great possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult is it is for those who have riches to inherit the kingdom of God and now the the thing that I want to encourage you on is it, like it says Mark when he writes this he says Jesus looked at this young man and loved him could you imagine what that look would have been like he didn't say he loved him he just looked at him and loved him and what I want to say is like he had a, a hard word for this young man right and we don't know maybe this young man down the road followed Jesus and you know kind of got his life kind of sorted out in the sense of the the, the core issues in his heart and when Jesus looked at him and he just he just he wanted this rich young ruler to be free from the things that hindered him right and of course we know that even though this this young guy did all he, he dotted all his eyes and crossed all his T's that there was something rooted in his heart that was far greater than keeping the law and that was the love of money and you know the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and so when Jesus said you know sell everything you have and give to the poor and follow me that was an invitation for him to to come and be a disciple of Jesus you know it was such an amazing invitation but he went away sorrowful because he, he just had too much wealth right and sometimes when the Lord will speak words to us or words of encouragement uh, or they might even seem like a little bit of hard words but 
you know, I just want to encourage you that when he does speak these words to us, he's loving us. He's looking at us and he's loving us. And all he wants us to do is he wants to remove the things in our lives that hinder us. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, uh, the, the writer of Hebrew talks about this. It's our calling to run the race that is set before us. It says, let us, uh, therefore, let us also, seeing we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with patient, patience the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame and had sat down at the right hand of God. You see, the call of the Christian life, right, is to throw off the things that hinder us and the sin that so easily trips us up. And and, and the call is to just kind of lighten our load and fix our eyes on Jesus and run the unique race that you and I were called to run. Well, today I want to talk about one of those things that can hinder us in our relationship with God and growing with God, um, being sons and daughters to the Father, and that is the hindrance of unbelief. And, you know, we could be here all day talking about all of the stories in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, where Israel did not believe God. They they just didn't trust him. They didn't have confidence in him. They didn't believe the things that he promised to be true. And one of those stories, uh, which is quite interesting, is the story of Moses and the Israelites. And and God had uh, told them that there was a promised land for them. And he said, go take it. Go, just go. I've given it to you. Just go and possess it. So Moses had sent, they were wandering around in the desert. And Moses sent 12 spies into the land to see this incredible land. And it's interesting uh, that 10 of the 12 came back with negative reports and they said we are like grasshoppers in our own sight like we were just like we're so small there's giants in the land and all this other stuff and only two that was Joshua and Caleb actually took a hold of what the promise was from God and said yeah like you know let's go let's take the land you know because they had like grapes you know they had a take took two people to carry a, a a bunch of grapes it was in a beautiful land but they were afraid and they really struggled to believe that god was who he said he was at that point and the writer of hebrews in hebrews 3 verse 19 refers to this that their their refusal to enter into the promised land when he says these words we see that they were not able to enter in because of unbelief now, unbelief is one of the most powerful words that um, will prevent uh, things from happening in our lives. Because you know, the Holy Spirit is just you know, so gentle and so loving and so persistent. But if we refuse to believe what he is offering, or if, we're, if we refuse to receive the reality of the kingdom, it's very, very difficult for God to... to to force it on us because, you know, we have free will. We have decisions. We have choices. And, and there's an example of this in Jesus' own life. And, you know, Jesus was the Son of God. He went around healing, doing good, uh, you know, just absolutely destroying the works of the devil. But then he comes home to his hometown. It were the people who were familiar with him, who knew him. And, you know, he was just the son of a carpenter. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, it says, in speaking of Jesus, it says, he didn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now think of that for a moment. Jesus healed, for the most part, everybody that came to him. But when he came to his hometown where there was unbelief, even Jesus struggled to do you know, the, the, the miracles because, and it wasn't like he struggled, but he just didn't do them because there wasn't faith that was connected with the people. So I think this area of unbelief is a very, very uh, important thing for us to be reminded of every once in a while because it really our entire Christian life is is rooted and grounded in, in faith, right? Like we have to believe that God exists, right? So, and if we even go back to the original sin, and, you know, we talk about what happened in, in, in the Garden of Eden, you know, we know that Satan came as a serpent and he sowed seeds of doubt into Adam and Eve, right? It says, because he actually 
caused Adam and Eve to question God's goodness. He painted a picture of God that he was insecure, and he deceived Eve into falling for a trap and taking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it says in Genesis chapter 3, Now the serpent was more subtle than any animal of the field which Yahweh God had made. He said to the woman, Has God really said, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? You see, it was this very this very issue that... Um, that they um, they struggled with, where where Satan actually said, "Well, it's God's God's really insecure. You know, He really really doesn't want you to have the full benefit of the garden. There's one tree that He He just if you take of it, you're going to be like Him, and He doesn't want that. And so the original sin was based on a lie, and Satan lied to Adam and Eve about the goodness of God, and they actually believed that lie, and as a result, we know what happened in humanity. So I, I, I think that it's really important when we are living our Christian lives that we're very, very aware of the enemy's devices. The Bible says don't be ignorant of the wiles of the devil. We need to be aware of the devices of the enemy. And Jesus speaks about this and he, when he talks about uh, Satan in John chapter 8 verse 44 uh, and he's speaking to the Pharisees who were just you know, not really being nice to him at the time and he said you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and doesn't stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie he speaks of his own for he is a liar and its father. So in, in another translation says he is the father of lies. You see when whenever Satan speaks he speaks his native language is lying. He never speaks the truth and of course you know the people who are really good at lying they can take a truth and just twist it ever so slightly that it appears to be true but it's 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 actually completely false. And you know when we understand our adversary. Now we don't have to focus a whole lot. I don't like talking about these kind of things as far as the enemy, but we need to understand what the battleground is in our own lives, why we struggle the way we do, and how God wants us to become, you know, uh, to overcome these things. You know, there are many biblical descriptions of the enemy of our souls. John 10 says, the thief kill comes to kill, steal and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. 1 Peter 5, 8 says that uh, the devil comes as a roaring lion, lion seeking to those whom he who will devour. Now, he comes like a roaring lion. He isn't a roaring lion because we know there is a roaring lion and his name is Jesus. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah and he lives in us. See, he comes as a counterfeit and he tries to portray an image that he really isn't. And uh, we know that the authentic, real lion of Judah lives in us. Luke 8, uh, verse 11 to 12, we won't read it, but it talks about the parable of the sower and the seed. And, and you know, the, the sower sows the, the seed, which is the word of God, and then the birds come and they steal it. And that is like Satan. He will try to steal the word of God in your life and in my life so that it will not root in our lives. In 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26, it says that he comes to take people captive to do his will. And in Revelation 12:10 it says that he is the accuser of the brethren. In 2 Corinthians 11:13 it says that he masquerades as an angel of light. And basically what that means is that he actually comes that we actually think it's God and it's actually him masquerading as an angel of light. So these are the things that we really want to understand when we're just living out, when we're hearing voices, when we're feeling feelings in our heart. Are they coming from God or are they coming from the father of lies? You see, uh, the devil's ultimate plan is to distort God's image, right? That's what his, his, his mandate. He doesn't really care uh, for you or me, uh, you know, other than to destroy us. And the reason why he wants to destroy us, because he wants to hurt God. He cannot hurt God directly. So what will he do? He will hurt what God loves. If anybody is a parent and you're listening to this today, you know, you will know that you would much rather suffer than to see your children suffer, right? Because that is the heart of a parent. Well, the enemy who wants to, to hurt God, his plan and purpose is to hurt those whom, whom the Father loves. And that's us. And he'll use whatever tools he, he can get his hands on. Uh, he uses uh, broken wounded earthly fathers you know because God is a father right and the fatherhood uh, and motherhood was meant for us to be um, a, a representative of the character and the nature of God 
and of course the enemy has attacked that right from day one and you know his plan and his purpose has been to try to uh, distort what a father is and so he will use fathers and he has used fathers in our own lives that have been hurt themselves and were little children once who needed to be loved and they they were hurt from their fathers and mothers but he will use broken wounded earthly fathers to distort God's image he'll use legalistic religious leaders you know like where where the Pharisees you know where Jesus said that you're you know uh, he, you know he, he had the hardest time with the Pharisees He'll, you know, he'll use an orphan world system, whatever he can, so he can lie to us, so that we might be able to be convinced that we might believe the lie that what he is saying is true rather than what God is saying. You know, he will masquerade himself as God, he'll lie to us, he'll accuse us, and he will condemn us. He is in no way in our corridor. Only God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are are in your corner. Paul the Apostle writes in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? That is the most amazing promise and I want to encourage you today, no matter what you're feeling in your heart, no matter what you're struggling with right now, that God would just encourage you that He is greater as He that is in me than He that is in the world. You know, that He is greater than anything that you and I are going through. You see, Satan is the ultimate orphan. The Bible says in Isaiah 14, 12 to 15, that he was cast out of God's presence. And God is Father, so he was cast out of the, the, the Father's presence. And his mission ever since then is to just to bring destruction upon humanity. He, he, it started with deceiving Adam and Eve in the garden. And that's where they formed an unholy alliance with, with Satan. And, and the, the whole mission of the great orphan that is Satan himself is to bring humanity into the same orphan spirit that he carries and so that is that is w what we are dealing with in everyday life the Bible says uh, Paul writes in 2nd Corinthians 4 verses 3 to 4 even if our good news is veiled it is veiled in those who perish in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that the light of the good news of the glory of Christ who is the image of God should not dawn on them you see it's the um, Satan's mission and his plan and his purpose is to blind the 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 minds of the unbelieving and that's his his strategy is that he absolutely wants to kill steal destroy blind whatever he does but praise God that we are not blind that we see we are not children of the dark we are children of the light and God wants us to walk in the light as as he is in the light see it's, it's even interesting when you look at the life of Jesus and you know after he comes out of the waters of baptism and you know the father the, the heavens are torn open and the father speaks from heaven saying you're my son whom I love and you am well pleased the Holy Spirit descends like a dove I mean this whole thing was was a celebration of sonship right this was Jesus launch into into full-time ministry and and the father sent him by saying you're my boy that's my paraphrase. I love you. You're my boy and I am proud of you. I am pleased with your life. So then Jesus comes out of the celebration of sonship, out of the waters of baptism and immediately he goes into the wilderness, wilderness and he fasts for 40 days. Then after 40 days, you know, Satan comes to him. And it's in Matthew chapter 4, 1 to 11. We won't read it. But Satan, what does Satan attack Jesus directly on? He attacks Jesus on the very thing that was just celebrated before he came into the, the desert. And that was his sonship. He said, if you are the son of God, make these stones bread. If you are the son of God, you know, throw yourself down from the temple. It was like, well, are you really? Well, you're going to have to prove it because I don't believe it. And you're going to, I demand proof. And I love how Jesus responded to the, the devil. He didn't try to negotiate. He didn't try to argue. All he said was, it is written. And man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It was like the the way that the enemy, uh, that, that Jesus dealt with the enemy, was just to declare what God said, not what what Jesus even said. It was like this is God's. This is this is the authority that I come in. I come in my Father's authority, and He just said it is written. And so I really do believe that this gives us a bit of a 
um, a, a roadmap on how are we to deal when, when Satan comes to us and says, are you really a son? Are, are you really loved by the Father? Did, like, did, maybe God loves somebody else, but he saw what you did last week. He doesn't love you. He loves everybody else, but he, how could he love you? And the, all of those things are lies, right? We know they're lies, and, and it comes from the father of lies, but it's like how do we actually deal with this? And I, I just really want to encourage you that what we're called to do. It's really, really simple. You see, I truly believe that Jesus said the kingdom belongs to little children, right? And so to me, that anything that is too complicated for a child to understand in the gospel is too complicated because Jesus said that the greatest in the kingdom will be those with a childlike heart. So what, in all this stuff, what is the work that you and I are called to do? Well, in John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29, uh, this is uh, people talking to Jesus, and this is what they say. They said, therefore, to him, what must we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. You see, the work that God has called us to is to simply believe. That is what we're called to do. He does the rest. We believe. We believe he is who he says he is. We believe Jesus is who he says he is. That we believe that we are in Christ and Christ is in us and Jesus is in the Father. So the Father is in us. By the power of the Spirit, we are sealed with, with, the, with the adoption of, of the Abba that comes within us, right? That is the reality. And that word believe here in the Greek is to have faith in, to tr and trust, to commit to trust. So believing is not only um, uh, an intellectual declaration of something that is true, or acknowledging something is true, but it is actually trusting in God. The work of God is just to simply trust Him. And, you know, this is where I think little kids got it. They got it right down. They have no problem trusting. When they're in a loving and nurturing environment with parents that love them and want the best for them, they have absolutely no problem with trust. And then their, their parents do the rest. All they have to do is trust, and they just believe what their, their parents say, and then everything else is, it will work out, right? And of course, in Hebrews 11, verse 6, we, we read this, and it says, Without faith it is impossible to be well-pleasing to him, for he who comes to God must believe that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You see, see... If we don't believe that God is who he says he is, how can we believe that we are who he says we are? You see, faith is what pleases God. He absolutely loves it. He, he understands where you're coming from. He knows where I'm coming from. He sees all of the opposition in our lives. He has seen your life and my life and how he has been modeled to us through parents, through religious leaders, through school systems, whatever. And so when we come out and say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You know, I, I believe in you, but there's things in my heart that I struggle with. He understands why you feel that way. And his heart is filled with compassion. But for you to say, you know, Lord, I still believe. You know, even though I, maybe I haven't had a, a, the greatest father figure in my life, I still believe that you are a good dad. And I truly believe that kind of dec declaration absolutely pleases his heart. You see, many people struggle to believe that God loves them. They might find it easy to believe that God loves somebody else. But because of their own life experiences, because of the hardships, because of the rejection, because of the judgment, because of the, the abandonment, because of the abuse, because of the pain, they just go like, how could God love me? Because of the mistakes, you know, because of, you know, all our own sinfulness, you know, all the things that we struggle with. You know, the truth is, is that, that our life doesn't always line up with, with when God says God loves us. And we, we really struggle with this way. I remember there was one time I was, I was talking, uh, I was talking to um, a young boy and he was considering converting to the Muslim faith. And uh, so we, we talked about the, the Muslim faith. We talked about Christianity. I got him to read the Father's love letter. We discussed the scriptures. And I just said to him at the end of our conversation, I said, what if it's true? What if it's true that God absolutely is such a good father that he really created you to be his son, that you to be born again into his kingdom and live as his son forever? I said, what would, what would life look like? What do you think about that? And you know what his answer was? 
He said, it sounds too good to be true. You know, many of us live the Christian life as if it's too good to be true. We live a life like, well, it sounds nice. You know, the Bible says that, but it's almost like we, we live as if it's a fairy tale. And I just want to encourage you today that God himself wants to, to, to absolutely overwhelm you uh, with his love, overwhelm you with the sense of he is who he says he is, and that you would have confidence in that. You know, I really believe it's more about us being able to receive than to initiate, right? Religion is us initiating to God. Christianity is us learning to receive from God. And in 1 John chapter 4, it says, we love because he first loved us. And I really believe that the more that you and I are able to, to experience his love, to, to live in his love, to receive his love, to be, begin to believe more and more that he really meant what he says. I really am his son. I, I really am a child of the li living God. I think the more that that can start to come into our hearts, the more that it will transform everything about us. Now, when we struggle with unbelief, like for you, I, I can only speak for myself. Let me put it this way. If I struggle with unbelief, and what I will say to God is, Lord, I know you're faithful, you're good, I love you, you're, you're trustworthy, but I've got, some, I've got the problems. It's not your issue, God, it's mine. I am the one that struggles with unbelief, right? So, I don't know, does anybody else, can anybody else kind of identify with that? That that's when we, we have this faith issue? Well, it's me. It's not God. I, God is who he says he is. It's, it's me. But there's a problem with that. Now, think about it for a second. If I, if I said to my wife, my darling wife, Anne, who's on the webcast today, that if I, if I said, honey, I can't believe that, that you love me, what am I saying to her? Even if she says, I love you, I love you, I love you, and I say, no, you know what, I don't believe it. Is it, do I have the problem, or am I really making a statement what I believe about her? I am making a statement what I believe about her. Because I'm going like, I don't believe you love me. So even though I might say, oh, I struggle with faith, I struggle with believing, what I'm saying to her is that you don't love me. I don't believe that you're, what you're saying is true. So the thing is, is if I say the same thing to God, that, Father, I can't believe that you love me. I am, it's not about him, about me, like I think I'm struggling with faith. No, I'm making a declaration about who he is, that he isn't trustworthy. And the things that he has said about me aren't true. You see, God wants to be able to, 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 to deal with the heart issue that unbelief is the fruit of mistrust. That, you know, if we don't trust somebody, we won't believe what they say. And, you know, so many of us have, have really struggled with trust, right? Because as children, we, we have been violated, you know, our, we've been disappointed by people. And I really want to encourage you that God wants us to trust him. He loves it when we trust him. In the midst of an orphan world system that are, that's screaming the opposite, when we just rise up in, with the best we can and we just say, Lord, I trust you, even though I, everything inside of me is screaming that, you know, I, I ought not to. He just absolutely loves it. He just, because see, see, what we're, we're dealing with on this side of heaven, we will never, ever have a choice, a chance to do this again, at least as far as I know. That once we are with Jesus, you know, once we see Jesus face to face, once we're in heaven, I mean, we're, gonna, we're not going to have need for faith anymore because we're going to be with him. But it's this side of heaven that you and I get the opportunity every day when we wake up, when we hear those lies coming into our ears, to rise up in faith and say, you know what, I truly believe that God is who he says he is. It's at this side of heaven that we get to do that. And I really believe that when we trust God, it's like we're declaring our love for him. And the more that we declare that in the midst of our circumstances, the more I believe it blesses his heart. Now, I don't know about you, but I struggle to believe. You know, I am not a man of great faith. I don't feel that way. I feel that I, I struggle with anxiety and worry more than I ought to. And, and I, you know, God is draw, drawing me into him, and he's encouraging me more and more that he is who he says he is. But if there's anybody here who struggles to believe, if there's anybody here who said, you know what, I have, I have faith crises, or I may be in a faith crisis right now, this promise from 2 Timothy 2.13 is such a wonderful promise, not only for you, but for me too. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot de deny himself. And the, the New Living Translation version says, If we are unfaithful, 
he remains faithful for he cannot deny who he is. You see, even in the midst of our crises, even in the midst of our frustrations, even in the midst of all those things, Papa God is continually to be faithful. He's continuing to say, I love you, I believe in you. I cannot disown you because you are one with Jesus and Jesus is in me. I can't, I can't, deny, I can't deny myself. I cannot deny who I am because you're in him and, you're, and he's in you. Like, he just, it's, it's not about you know, um, how we we. we Pick out the, the flower petals. He loves me. He loves me not. God is not on that roller coaster with us. He loves us full stop. And even when we have crises, he continues to love us. And he, and, he, and he wants us to begin to believe more and more that he is who he says he is. You know, I really believe it pleases his heart. And Matthew 5.48 says that he's the perfect father. And James 1.17 calls God the father of lights. Every good and perfect gift that comes from the father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Hebrews 12.9 says that God is the father of our spirit. 1 John 3.1 says how great is the love that the father has lavished on us. That we should be called the children of God and that is what we are. And Matthew 7, 11 to, uh, um, 7, 7 to 11 says God gives good gifts to his kids. And Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Period. 1 John 4, 16 says, God is love. You know, I truly believe that the more that you and I, as Jesus said, it is written, that we would stand even in the midst of the struggles that we have, that Father, help me, but I just declare that you are God of, uh, of love, that you are love, that you are my Father, that you are perfect in every way, and that you give good gifts to your kids. And I truly believe that the more that you and I can walk in the reality of that, the more that we will live that way, and the more it will be infectious with the, with the people all around us. In Romans eight fifteen to 17 we're heirs of God and I'm just going to read it it says for you didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry Abba Father the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs heirs of God and join heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified with him that is a promise that you and I are children of the Most High, that the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a deposit to guarantee our inheritance, and that Holy Spirit bears witness with us that we are God's kids, that we belong to Him, and the only appropriate response is to cry out, Abba, Daddy, Papa. And then it goes on to say that, that we are not only children of God, but we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Himself. It is the most amazing thing. I really believe that the more that we can just align ourselves with the truth of who we are, the more it's going to help us to continue to grow in faith and grow in love and grow in grace. Romans 8, 35 to 39. I'm just declaring some scriptures here. Paul writes, Who shall separate us, uh, separate us from the love of Christ? Could oppression or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Even as it is written, For your sake we are killed all day, all day long. We were accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will, at, will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's quite a bit, isn't it? I mean, he's, uh, Paul covered an awful lot of things that there is nothing in all creation that will separate us from his love. Now, there are going to be lots of things that come to try to separate us. I'm not saying that those things, those things will come. You know, it's just, it, the truth is that God's love is an eternal love. And the more that we have a revelation that he has loved us with an everlasting love and he will continue to love us, the more that it will transform us. You see, I, my prayer today even is that, that we, would, we, we would have our minds renewed. The Bible is, says that we are called to have the mind of Christ, that we begin to think like Jesus thinks now, that we, 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 the, the lies that come in, they don't have any place to land anymore because we, if somebody told me some bizarre thing that could not possibly be true, I would not have a problem not believing it. You know, I mean, I just say, well, that's not even true. I, that's, that's silly. 
you know, uh, my prayer is that God would come and that he would be so, his love would come to us and that our minds would become so renewed that when the enemy lies and says, well, God doesn't love you, he couldn't love you, that, we, that, that would, it would become such uh, 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 an untrue thought that we would never even struggle to believe, well, maybe he doesn't love me. But that faith would rise up. And in Romans 12, 1 to 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the good, well-pleasing, and perfect will of God. You see, that's God's plan for us. That's his heart for us, is that you and I would be come into this place of knowing his perfect will, that he loves us and that we, our, our, our thought life would come in alignment with, with who he says that we are. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 and 5 to 3, to five, Paul writes about this this battlefield in our in our mind, and he says, "For though we walk in the flesh, we don't wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but mighty before God to the throwing down of strongholds, throwing down imaginations and every high thing that is exalted against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ." You see, this is what the 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 work of God to believe, right? This is the work that we do, is that when there are thoughts that come in to our mind that are not in in line with the knowledge of God, with the truth of his word, with the reality of what he has said, that we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We say, nope, that is not from God, and we are not going to believe that, and we are going to declare the truth. So I just want to you know, as we, we wrap up this, I just, I just want to read from uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 21. And Paul writes a prayer. And I, 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 I want to encourage you, as I, as I, I read this, can you, can you take this for yourself? Can you, can you maybe pray with me that these things that Paul prays about right now will, be, will become more and more a reality for you and I, that 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 we would actually have the eyes of our hearts opened, that we could actually see who we are in Christ, and that you know that the angels are ministering servants to the heirs of salvation, that we are not living in a fallen world, uh, that is not our eternal destiny, and 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 just. You know, we're just having to struggle through life. But we are sons and daughters to the Most High God. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Today, the Bible says that we are seated in heavenly places. So my prayer is that, that when, I, when I declare this, this prayer that Paul prays, that you and I would say, yes, I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. I cry out, and even, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So, I'm, Father, I just pray right now for every person that is around the world, that is watching this webcast, that's listening to this webcast. Father, I just pray that right now there would be a tangible sense of your presence around each one of us. Uh, the, the sense of, of, Lord, I believe. Help me to believe, Lord. And knowing and with the comfort saying, even when we are faithless, you still remain faithful. That your love for us is not determined in our ability to believe. But God loves it when we believe. When God, when we apprehend the promises of God and we say yes and amen, he just loves it. It thrills his heart because we are just... We are just declaring that he is who he says he is. So, Father, I just pray right now that you would just encourage our hearts, that we would not, for the down, downtrodden, for the discouraged, for the frustrated today, Father, I just pray that your love would come, that your comfort would come, and that you would encourage us, Father, to teach us how to walk this life as sons and daughters, joint heirs with Jesus, seated in heavenly places right now, yet living in a broken, fallen world. So just can you just join me if you know if you can if you feel comfortable doing it, just maybe read it out loud when I'm saying it too or however you want to do it but I just want to declare this over us as as a truth as we end and then I'll ask Mark and John to come on for this cause I also having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which is among you and the love which you have to have toward all the saints don't cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to that working of the strength of his might, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him to sit at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Father, I just pray right now that we would know that we are safe and we are secure in you, that that we are seated with Christ far above all the authorities of this world, far above the prince of the power of the air, far above all of our, our life experiences and the brokenness, Lord, of this the, the, the humanity that we surrounds us in the orphan world system. Father, I just pray right now that faith would come. I pray that your, your people would be strengthened right now Lord I pray that strength and I just declare strength the strength of the Lord which is the joy of the Lord right the joy of the Lord is our strength so I just pray joy would go joy would come across the world right now to every one of your, your sons and your daughters I just feel like the Lord wants to encourage you today don't give up keep going keep believing you're doing well Father I just pray that we would become just to move more into the tangible reality of your presence as sons and daughters to the Father and that Lord that you would just I just pray for our ear gates, for the things that we listen to, the things that we think about, Lord, that don't come from you. I pray you would teach us how to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Lord, that we would begin to have our minds renewed more and more and more. What does it mean to be a son to the Most High? What does it mean to be a daughter of the Most High? I pray, Father, that we would learn that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Not because we've done anything to deserve it, but because Jesus did everything on our behalf. Father, I just pray, Father, that we just receive that free gift. Father, in, in, in everywhere, and, and it's our health, it's the health of our loved ones, whether it's our finances, whether it's our children, whether it's our future, whether it's our ministry, whether it's our occupation, whether it's our future relationships, Father, I just pray right now that the love of God would come, that the, that would just cause us to be strengthened, and that we would say, I believe, the work of God is to believe, and that we would just con- rise up in our spirits, Father, and just worship you for being such a good dad for sending your son 2,000 years ago to pay the price that we could never pay so that we could be born into your family so father thank you for that thank you that you're a good dad and that you will continue to reveal your goodness throughout all eternity I thank you that we are rooted and grounded in love so thank you dad we just commit that to you and just say lord we believe help our unbelief in Jesus' name. Amen. So guys, if you guys can come up.